Oh. I'm Shep Steiner, Associate Professor of Contemporary Art and Theory at the University of Manitoba and the editor of the journal Mosaic. I want to welcome you to the lecture series, Relative Time, Little Time, that the Dutch artist team, Vic van der Poel, has developed in collaboration with our journal. If you are unfamiliar with Vic van der Poel's practice, I'll briefly say that they have an acutely political perspective on the art field, especially with regard to the ways that art bleeds off into the everyday, into history, into larger processes. Their special area of practice involves archival politics, activating situations, and how dialogue and discourse shape the public sphere. Public engagement and art as a tool is a key to their practice, and we couldn't have organized this conference without them. Before I thank our sponsors and introduce our first speaker, I want to acknowledge the traditional land on which the University of Manitoba campuses are located the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you to the sponsors of our conference, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, the University of Manitoba Conference Sponsorship Program, and lastly, the Faculty of Arts, the School of Art, and the Institute for the Humanities, all at the University of Manitoba. As for questions to our speakers, please refrain from interjecting until the end of the lecture in the chat thread, simply indicate to my co-host, Sabrina Mark, our conference assistant, or Carolyn DeCorno, Mosaic's managing editor, that you have a question and we can unmute you. Now to welcome our first speaker. Frederick Nerat is associate professor and Mellon Morgridge professor of planetary humanities at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is a member of the editorial board of Multitudes, and he is a prodigious author. Six of his books remain untranslated from the French, and the two books of his that I have read, Atopia's Manifesto for a Radical Existentialism from 2017, and The Unconstructable Earth, An Ecology of Separation from 2019, should be on everyone's reading list. The title of Dr. Nurat's lecture is Heliopolitics, or How to Cure an Amnesic Sun. I'm very honored and happy to introduce Dr. Frederick Nerat. Um, say thank you. I'm very happy to, to present this, this work, uh, still in progress in a way, but we are still always in progress, right? And in this series, it's very interesting. And, um, and so I want to begin uh, Let's begin, right? It's time to begin. And so I begin right now to, to, read, um, to read this talk. So what is uh, oil? What is oil? I try to see if my PowerPoint works. It seems to work. The black corpse of the sun, according to the writer and philosopher Reza Negarestani while the anthropologist Natasha Myers invites us to consider a phytocene hidden behind the Anthropocene, which will refer to the era of life opened up by those green beings that are plants, hence the prefix phyto, and their willy aptitude for their chemical process, for that chemical process known as photosynthesis. It is on the slide. All cultures and political economies, she writes, local and global, turn around plants, turn around plants' metabolic reasons. Plants make the energy dense sugars that fuel and nourish us. What are fossil, fossil fuels and plastics but the petrified bodies of once living photosynthetic creatures? creatures. We have thrived and we will die 
burning their energetic accretions. And so it is not an overstatement to say that we are only because they are. I translate the words of Myers and Negarestani in this way. Oil is an amnesic sun. It has forgotten the cosmological mediation of plants. It has repressed its extraterrestrial ancestry. Through these metaphors, I would like to shed light on the darkness that reigns in our relationship to oil. Everything happens as if in our social, economic, and psychic relationship with oil, we are caught in a trap, in the bedrock, to follow out the metaphor, in which petro civilization holds us prisoner. Petro civilization is a perfect geo capitalist trap. Given that any technological effort to escape it requires oil as its necessary energetic condition, strengthening its status as universal exchanger, as that liquidity which plays the role of irresistible, irresistible liquidator. Perfect exchange, as I say. The more oil is exhumed, extracted from the depths of the earth, the more we prepare the conditions of our decomposition, our sixth extinction, our programmed entry into a biomass that will eventually be turned into oil for a world stripped of its human beings. An oil for human exchange of deep cosmic irony. If we want to extricate ourselves from this trap, from this cave whose shadows indicate platonic objects less than they anticipate the six mass extinction, then prior to envisaging any political program or technological alternatives, we must first undertake a kind of petroanalysis. The later must take the form of a kind of collective psychoanalysis, a geoanalysis whose aim will be to pass through the fantasy that lies stuck in oil, stuck in oil that burns in the atmosphere and programs ecocide. This analysis of our geological unconscious, of the geological unconscious of human societies, will aim to reveal what black gold conceals, the sun that is its source. The sun along with the entire cosmos that is covered over by all space and climate change. What I propose in this talk is therefore a regradient or retrogressive analysis, one that goes against the grain of so-called progress, progress and aims to foster a change of civilizational paradigm able, capable of sustaining an anti-extractivist heliopolitics. Such a heliopolitics must be commensurate with our planetary condition. And it is an approach of this kind that I strive to outline in my current research. So to shape this regradient analysis, the first section of the talk will reverse the course of time, starting from plastic and heading back in time to the sun via oil and plants. This ascent towards the sun will, in a second stage, lead us to an astonishing discovery. The sun is not located beyond the earth, but instead, covered in oil, inhabits its interior. Once this topology has been revealed, I will, with George Bataille, concentrate on the dual nature of the sun as both agent of life and vector of death. The third and fourth sections will explore, starting from the examples of the emperor Julian the apostate or apostate, or apostate and Campanella's city of the sun, how this dual nature 
could inform an ecological and democratic heliopolitics. While the last section proposes by way of conclusion, some foundations for this heliopolis whose outline this talk will have thought to describe. As an ultimate Tellurian lubricant, writes Negarestani, oil simply makes things move forward, enables everything to circulate, and maintains that order of things instituted by petrocapitalism. Oil is a lubricant oriented by a feature of artificial lights, those that hang from the sailings of the skyscrapers of the wealthy in the shelters they build to protect themselves from the collapse of civilization, and inside the rockets they send into space to shed light on the uninhabitable, sometimes with tourists now. The aim of this talk is to challenge the oil narrative, the tale about oil dictated to us through our own actions, our political and technological choices. As Stéphanie Le Ménager notes, the difficulty of contesting this narrative lies in the fact that it requires us to challenge the, ent the entire publishing chain that runs from the making of books to the dissemination of messages. Oil not only speaks, ventriloquizing its imperatives through our words, but also presides over the very mat materiality of individual, of individual and mass media communication. Should we stop speaking? Sometimes I think about that, you know, of writing. Should we oppose a leaden silence to stone oil, since this is what Petra Oleum means? Getting out of oil does indeed depend on opposing the word of ecocide. Yet to leave it without having rigorously traversed it would be a dead end. The way to the exit must come from within that world, from exposing within it that which exceeds it, the very old and the very recent, and the sun in the plastic. Against the progressive allure of the old narrative, let us first propose a narrative regression, bringing out the very old, the forgotten, the luminous and the shades of green within the viscous. Let us go from plastic to the sun through a kind of material analogy a geocosmological ascent towards the sun of time. Here then is this narrative, this, narr this narratological reversal and what it makes visible. From plastic and therefore from today, from a situation of ocean suffocated by the plastic element, it travels back in time and space in order to return first of all to polymers and monomers, and then to naphtha, the raw material that comes from refining crude oil. After that, finding crude oil in tar sands and lower down in reservoir rock and still lower down in source rock. As we go further back in time, we see the source rock rising because it was not always heavy enough to burrow into the depths of the earth and give rise due to the increase in heat and pressure to the pyrolysis mechanism, the separation by fire, which in its tone womb isolated the crude oil from oxygen and nitrogen. Before its descent, we see the mother rock trap the kerogene that is the source of crude oil. A bioenergetic twist ending. Grasping that kerogen is an organic compound which has become solid and insoluble, say for pyrolytic action, under the action of anaerobic bacteria living in an oxygen-free environment. 
The kerogen turning back into an undecomposed biomass, a biomass made up of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen that had once been the ingredients of living things, that is, of plankton, animals, plants. From the plastic on the surface of the ground, then, we descended into the bedrock. Before rising up, we sit again to the surface. But after having reached the plants, without which there would be no animals and no life on Earth, we owe it to ourselves to rise still further to the sun. Because without plants and without photosynthesis, there will be no fossil energy. With photosynthesis, terrestrial elements, water and CO2, encounter the sun in such a way as to give rise to organic matter. To understand the formation of oil is not just to consider the tens of hundreds of millions of years involved in the dark, very dark constitution, in its very dark constitution, but also to measure the time opened up by the appearance on Earth of photosynthesis. At the moment of the great oxidation, more than 2.3 billion years ago. Oil, that's an important thing, is less old than it seems. Its narrative is biased. It creates a smoke screen, abuses, abuses its power. Its limit Petrarchy takes the place of the human life that it dresses and of the sun that it replaces with flames and combustion, combustion engines. That utterly magical, totally cosmic, alchemical process that tethers earthly plant life in reverent rhythmic attention to the Earth's solar source Photosynthesis is, as Myers allows us to comprehend, indeed the operation that makes the sun and the cosmos appear as that which, as that with which we compose terrestrial life. In the second part of my talk, I would consequently like to make the sun shine in the oil and to begin to bring out the temporality of an other grand narrative, as well as another topology, an alternative way to represent, of representing the universe and the Earth's place within it. The pre-oil great or grand narrative, linking the sun of yesteryear to the sun of tomorrow, photosynthesis to photovoltaics, invites us to modify Plato's famous cave allegory. In fact, the sun is not outside the cave. For the happy few who escape the chains of shadowy truths and who can enjoy outside the common lot the good of which the sun is the idea, rather, the sun is inside the cave, but forgotten, forgotten in the black rocks and all shapes, the stone oil that rises from the subsoil and passes into bitumen, cars, planes, and unconscious rockets. Let us translate this into metapolitical terms. Leaving the geocapitalist cave, getting out of its petrochemical trap cannot only, cannot consist only in replacing one technology with another or in proposing some ecological transition, even a Green New Deal, without initiating a profound modification of the way in which we relate our being in the world to the universe that sustains and traverses our terrestriality. By, su by supporting oil in its analysis, the recognition of its solar origin 
via the decomposition of living organisms, it is our own terrestriality that is put under investigation. Oil is our geocosmological unconscious, the repository of what we have not been able to conceive because we cannot see it right there in front of us. This being the constraint that applies when faced with what is brightest and what is darkest, where shadows no longer sketch and outline. In La Rochefoucauld's famous dictum, neither the sun nor death can be looked at steadily, let us replace death with oil. It is as though, as though we have looked at oil with, without seeing it, as if it were only value, as if oil were only value or liquid, whereas it has always been, always been a ghost. The life moving of itself of that which is dead, to use a definition that Hegel once applied to money. Oil is an opaque sign of the solar pass that we have not been able to take of the heliopolitics that we have missed and that I would like to make re-emerge. Oil is a ductile trace of an unfulfilled political past. And we must make the choice we have failed to make shine within it, transforming it into a dialectical image, uh, to borrow from Walter Benjamin's uh, vocabulary, that is into an entity to which is added the invisible layer of what has been hoped for and of what this expectation held in promise, however untenably. In other words, we must support oil in its analysis in order to realize that it is also our analysis that is at stake. To simply condemn oil will be to prevent ourselves from sizing hold of our desire, which circulates in it and by it. And it will thus be to maintain and change the fantasy on which this desire is built, consequently reinforcing the geocapitalist deadline. We need to traverse the fantasy to use, uh, to borrow from Lacan, psychoanalyst Lacan. Invent the technology and the politics that you want, but is a reject oil without extracting and refining the promise of happiness that was contained within it, then they risk either proposing, proposing a way of life that is not worth living, communities in survival mode. Huh? Why? Why survival? Or taking on this unanalyzed promise as is. If this is a geocosmological psychoanalysis, it must be accompanied by radical political and technological changes aimed towards an image of happiness. This image is what I make transit through the solar interior of the world. With this last expression, I seek to name the way out through the interior that is represented by the sun and its abstract and dangerous vital power, which we must now study. When the goddess and gods of ancient Egypt are depicted only in human or animal form. They leave an impression of incompletedness, of being only an impoverished dimension of the cosmos. The cosmos is truly revealed only through falcon-headed human bodies and human-headed lion bodies, bimorphic or bimorphic beings that articulate animality with the cosmological. 
The key figure of such an articulation is Horus. One of the most primitive Egyptian deities of whom we are reminded by Enki Bilal in his graphic novels, the Nicopol trilogy. Depicted as a falcon or as a human form with a falcon's head, Horus is first and foremost the sky god and seems historically to precede the appearance of the sun god Ra. It is notable, however, that these two gods, Horus and Ra, are merged under different names and apparent appearances, depending on the region of Egypt and their local specific translation of the divine. We consequently find the representation of a cult in which the solar star is inscribed in the sky in the wings of a falcon. This is because the solar god has a geometrical figure as its archaic referent. The solar circle, sometimes worshipped as such under the name of Aten, a geometrical abstraction capable of blending into any terrestrial or outer space figure. In mythological accounts and illustrations, the solar god can indeed be found everywhere in the underworld, on the earth, and in the heavens, and can merge with all the gods, hence Ra, Arakti, Atum-Ra, Amun-Ra, and so on. His deterritorializing power will support the project of Akhenaten, who reigned in the 14th century BCE, imposing Aten as a unique and transcendent god. With Akhenaten, geometry seeks to dissolve human and animal figures, other gods, Horus and falcons. As if the solar disk, which had hitherto rested on Aten as a falcon-headed god, was using its destructive power of abstraction by forgetting the other source of its universal, universalizing capability, not its geometry, but its vital presence on Earth, its beneficent, beneficent radiation. Yet this double aspect is perhaps the very, the very essence of how we should understand the god Ra it is geometrical and geothermal, abstract and concrete, dissolving and vital. Georges Bataille, too, was keenly interested in animal gods, and it was through them that he grasped the dual nature of the sun. There is, he tells us, the high sun, abstract, mathematical, a sun we do not look, one which is not an object for the senses, which cannot be except to reveal if in madness we gaze upon it, another sun, another sun, one which is destructive of the gaze, a concrete but deadly sun. Where the first is beauty beyond the senses, the second is immediate horror. And there is a, here an excerpt from Georges Bataille's Rotten Sun. In mythology, mythology, he writes, the sun that is gazed upon is identified with a man who slays a bull, with a vulture that hits the liver. In other words, with the one who looks along with the slain bull or the eaten liver. The Mithraic cult of the sun led to a very widespread religious practice. People stripped naked in a kind of pit that was covered with a wooden scaffold upon which a priest would slash the throat of a bull. Thus, they were suddenly doused with a beautiful shower of hot blood, accompanied by the sound of the birds struggling and bellowing, a simple way of reaping morally the benefactions of the blinding sun. Of course, the bird itself is also an image of the sun, but only with its throat slit. One might add that the sun has, has also been expressed mythologically by a man slashing its, his own 
his own throat, as well as by an anthropomorphic being deprived of a head. So the vitality, the vital aspect of the sun is inseparable from violence, the Thai tells us. The beautiful shower of hot blood and the benefactions of the blinding sun pass through killing and the sun as life and sight seeps into the negative universality of the throated bull or the acephalic human being deprived of the head that this human being has lost in order to see the impossible. The analysis proposed by Bataille is very useful, making it possible for us to avoid a fascination with the benefactions of the sun that does not more than replace the fascination with the benefits of oil and the necessity to have this kind of you know, geoanalysis. For the sun is a destroyer as well as a bearer of life. It is a source of photosynthesis, yes, but it is also what leads each day to the desiccation of life on earth, as well as being extremely dangerous for the whole terrestrial technological system in the event of, major, of a major solar storm. Double is the sun, double is the sun as is the whole universe. And in this sense, what I want to say to conclude this section, this part of my talk, is that no heliopolitics will be able to draw upon the sun without also charging itself by symbolizing its dark side. My aim, my aim however, my goal, however, is not to propose a pagan neo-solar neo -solar cult to support 21st century ecological politics. That's not my goal. On the one hand, one cannot really claim that the political system of ancient Egypt in any way anticipated the politics of democratic emancipation. And it is rather the mega machine, uh, to use a term from, to use Lewis uh, Mumford's uh, concept, and its human tools utilized in the bloodthirsty construction of the pyramids that should be kept in mind as the authoritarian center of the policies of the pharaohs. On the other hand, solar verticality can easily be translated into political verticality. Akhenaten and Nefertiti claimed that they alone possessed the ability to interpret the words of Aten. And even the highest placed in the hierarchy of Christ was said to be the price of Akhenaten and not the price of, not the price of Aten. Consequently, serving the Pharaoh before serving the God. A despotism can base its symbolic politics and its system of representations on the appropriation of the sun. As a French guy, you know, I cannot forget Louis XIV, Louis XIV, Louis, Louis XIV, that has accepted, he may have accepted, you know, the astronomical revolution inaugurated in the 16th century, but he did so only in order to strengthen his own centrality, identifying himself, and that's the problem, with the sun and colonizing the sky. It is still a question of knowing whether on the, ba on the basis of the metaphorics opened up by solar cosmology, it is possible to found anything other than a despotism. And it is this question that I will explore in the remaining, remaining parts of my talk. Because an internal gap has been identified now between abstraction and polymorphic territorialization, transcendence and immanence, death and life. And this gap must indeed find political expression if, and that's my hypothesis, hypothesis, if we are to avoid solar despotism and its theological underpinning. Perhaps this can be illustrated and explored by considering the ways in which the Egyptian moment was later replayed on the plane of symbolic politics, but this time against theological transcendence. 
I am thinking here of the philosopher Julian the Apostate, proclaimed emperor in 260 CE, who might perhaps have interrupted the course of history by opposing the coup de force of Christian universality had he not died in 363. In 361, Julian the philosopher, the name that suits him much better than Julian the apostate, given his substantial philosophical works. So he suspended all formalization of Christian worship in imperial institutions and demanded respect for pagan worship, forbidding Christians from teaching philosophy, rhetoric, and grammar, and, conse uh, and consecrating sun worship. It must be said that Julian received a Neoplatonist education in Athens and was probably initiated into the Eleusinian mysteries. Against Christian unity, then, Julian the philosopher proposed a solar pantheism, vector of an irradiating polytheism for which he would later receive praise from Voltaire, Diderot, and Montaigne, the last of whom devoted chapter 19 of book two of his essays to Julian and his freedom of conscience. Of conscience. Yet we might ask, in what way is the son any less transcendent than the Christian God? Julian provides his answer in his hymn to King Helios. It is on the slide. Helios, he tells us, is an intermediary situating between the intelligible gods and the world, imitating the synthetic power of the former among the intellectual gods, seeing that he proceeds from it, and yet also the source, the one from whom the rays of his light illumining all things descend to the visible world. A contingent, distant transcendence that cannot occupy a central place, Juliansen is epistemologically equipped to shift into the decentered universe of the Big Bang, if I exaggerate a little bit. My objective, however, is less to read the Neoplatonists of their taste for theology and transcendence, than to understand how solar duality can be located in the idea of the sun as mediation, where the latter can be used to block the theocratic machine and the strategic idolatry of Wicators. In the future Heliopolis that I am trying to outline, cosmological mediations must take precedence, precedence over theological transcendence. After all, it is indeed this transcendence in liquid form that gives oil its political harmfulness, its universal circulation. Against the uniform flow that springs forth from the fracking of the declining empire and the, mur and the murderous theocracies, let us advance the divided immanence of the sun and the freedom of conscience that it authorizes. A freedom also at work, as I will try to show in Campanella's City of the Sun. As if confirming the contemporary inability to understand revolutionary projects other than as incarnations, of some totalitarian demons, there exists a wish to present Campanella's The City of the Sun as a nightmare, the dream and excuse of all terrors as the last sentence of the afterword of the French edition of the book that I use for this part of my talk reveals to us. Yet only with a great deal of labor would it be possible to identify a foretaste of Stalinism and the concentration camps in a poetical dialogue about a society of solarians, I use a Campanella's terms, versed in the arts, sciences, the spirit of community, 
recognition of all workers and a critique of private property. It is on the slide. Public ownership of goods makes them rich and poor at the same time, rich in that they possess everything, poor in that they do not have possessions to serve while all possessions serve them. Not that bad for a Stalinist camp. Against this unconvincing accusation of early totalitarianism, what I would like to emphasize in this utopia is the, con the consideration of earth and the heavens and the geocosmological mediations that tie them together. Mediations that are highlighted by the six circular walls that, according to Campanella, surround the temple of the city of the sun. Walls whose external and internal sides are decorated with images drawn from the arts and sciences, planets and stars, mathematical figures, mathematical figures, part of the world, stones, liquids, plants, animals, and so on. Like a, a monumental work whose knowledge is not enclosed within a book or a library, but instead turned inside out like a glove and offered to the eyes of all. The high priest is called Sun. Campanella, having sided with Galileo and heliocentrism, and on the altar of the temple of the city, there are but two immense world maps, one representing the sky in its totality and the other the earth. I will make heaven the temple, stars the altar, writes Campanella in one of his poems. As for the longest prayer, it is, offer, it is offered, we learn, while gazing at the heavens. If the sun is central to the solarians, and yet they do not worship it, Campanella explains, it is because it belongs to the order of the created and not to that of God the creator. This explanation of the non-worship of the sun is, to say the least, astonishing. It seems to be addressed to Christians and their tendency to burn heretics, since Campanella earlier wants us, earlier, wants us that the Solarians rely upon nature without the revealed faith. And thus so it could be argued that in this respect, they did not really care about God the creator. We therefore need to propose another explanation. By forbidding, forbidding, forbidding the worship of the sun, the Solarians were, I believe, seeking more to affirm the incompleteness of their identity than to protect the transcendent God. To be a Solarian is to be connected to a solar ancestry without turning it into divine fullness. Here we, are, we have arrived then at a point quite far from any demand for purity of identity in the midst of a queer sun. It is true that solar mediations between earth and sky are for Campanella of an astrological type. And it could be argued that astrology and its system of planetary influences fail to consider the radical contingency that sculpts our identities, and in the same way sculpts our universe, this cluster of things scattered at random, as Heraclitus defines the cosmos in fragment 124. Nevertheless, the attention paid to what was then under the name of astrology, understood as cosmological materiality, and its relationship to the formation of society can for us serve as a record to be added to the file of what today proves to be an absolute necessity. The specificity of the Earth's climate can indeed be understood only through a comparative planetology, which is what the planetary, science, the planetary sciences put forward. Furthermore, Campanella asserts that with respect to the stars, we exist by chance. And his text concludes with the question of free will. It is on the slide. If a man 
after 40 hours of torture, will not reveal what he has resolved to keep secret, then not even the stars working so far off can force him to do so." End of quote. The stars act, he adds, not on the senses, but on reason, himself having been tortured for possessing seditious, seditious tendencies for his wish to establish a republic so as to shield it from the tyranny of the king of Spain and forced to feign madness under torture to escape death. After all, and against Galileo, Campanella had noted the absurdity of putting an absolutely motionless sun at the center of the world. Being composed of the most active fire, it was necessary to posit that it must spin about itself. Everything moves, everything shifts, as Pascal will say, and even the sun is incapable of calmly occupying a central place. If it is to be derived from a well-conducted petroanalysis, the new Heliopolis will be not fixed, but an unstable dwelling, a civic bivouac that spins almost endlessly and sails across an expanding universe. From ancient Egyptian religion to Campanella and via Julian the philosopher, I have aimed to show how the solar informs politics so as to conceive a Heliopolis and more particularly the Heliopolis we need today, which far from being a utopia funded, funded on the elimination of the past, selects from that past what will ensure its contemporary relevance. It seems to me that the Heliopolis to come will have to be based on a different energetic grand narrative, which by way of conclusion, I would like now to outline. This other grand narrative would follow on from the two that directly preceded it in the short span of time that has elapsed since the modern ruptures. First, there was a grand core narrative associated with the working class and with the political possibilities of collective struggle and the general strike. Then came the grand, the grand oil, oil narrative, which dissolved the collective in favor of the individualist dream of the middle classes. Another grand narrative is in the making today. It is my hope at least. The solar cosmological grand narrative seeking to replace the P troll that occupies the space of the imaginary and perpetually repeats. Better to burn, better to make the deserts, the deserts grow, throttle the population, depopulate, travel to Mars or move underground into a bunker. Better to go extinct, better anything than to let go of oil. We know this discourse, right? We hear it every day above our heads. And it is not the sun that is speaking then. This other grand narrative will certainly be formulated by starting from those who try to sink it, to put it into music. Think of uh, Sun Ra, for example, here, uh, I was thinking about the heliocentric words, his album. Think about uh, Nicole Mitchell and his uh, and her Xenogenesis Suite, or Terry Riley, his Sun Rings in 2002. Music and also into images, uh, the films of uh, Patrick Bonacop Bokanowski, for example, Un Rêve Solaire, The Solar Dream in 2016, and art, 
just one illustration. Okay, so of course there was in, there is an infinite, an infinite uh, number of um, possible other illustrations, but I was thinking about the planetary art of uh, James Turin. But also, and perhaps especially from all the experiences of blocking the flows of fossil energy, from the requirement to leave unexploited fossil energy reserves in the ground, from the rejection of the extractivist economy that raises forests, mountains, and peoples, from the indigenous solarities that use emergent solar infrastructure, like solar panels on tiny houses, to unsettle extractivism and acknowledge the self-determination and sovereignty of indigenous nations. What I therefore believe is that it would indeed be possible for the sun to be the energy referent of this grand narrative, of this new grand narrative, which would not be founded on the work of the worker. The 20th century missed the chance for a proletarian revolution that would have known how to change the meaning of technology. But nor would it be individualistic. Instead, it will propose a planetary use of the collective, both immanent in its terrestrial struggles and traversed by a cosmological plane and the mediations that supply its dynamism. Without going so far as to imagine mutations that would lead humans to become capable of photosynthesis, we could already promote large-scale solar energy use, photovoltaic self-consumption, on financial and other terms that I will not discuss in this talk. But as Lena Ballot reminds me, the development of solar energy should not come at the expense of land dedicated to food crops. Solar, she said to me, should be thought of as finely waving with the uses of the territory and be built as an extra layer that is added where the ground has already been covered with other things on rooftops, car parks, etc. Promoting renewable energy would, however, be the only way to have nuclear power and its jealousy of solar, its will to be an artificial sun. Consider, for instance, the case of ITER, International Thermonuclear experimental reactor, which amounts to an attempt to put the sun in the box by setting off nuclear fusion, as if to make a new sarcophagus of the sun. What nuclear power ensures is the reinforcement of the geocentric narrative that cuts itself off from the cosmos and again forgets the sun by encasing it in steel. Nuclear power, prolongs petroleum amnesia. And the narrative it proposes is as flawed as ITER's technology. The grand nuclear narrative is only a great, is only a great reef on which we might yet run aground, serving to remind of us of what is imminently dangerous about the sun. Not for a moment, however, is it a matter of believing that technologies, whether solar photovoltaic power plants or offshore wind farms, can in and of themselves supply the solution. As Pablo Servin and Rafael Stevens recently recalled, the implementation of alternative global technologies requires oil. This energy source that supports the world, the world system, the world system of the economy and the ecology of the earth as it has been constituted in the Anthropocene. But if we do not intend to leave the monopoly on political decision-making to despots and the few who benefit from energy crime, if it is indeed a matter of engaging with the many, the overwhelming majority in rejecting the extractivist nightmare of petrotechnics, then the sun, as my talk, as my talk seeks to transcribe its real, imaginary, 
and symbolic presence must be promoted or recognized as a radiant mediation of terrestrial politics. As a manifestation of Hegel politics, it is worth noting that just after the election of Donald Trump in 2016, young activists in the United States created a political organization called Sunrise, putting the issue of climate change and the end of fossil fuels at the center of their concerns. Close to the version of the Green New Deal defended by the socialist politician Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, they demand, they demand that the, the United States reduce greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2030 and call for massive federal investments in infrastructure and an ecological transition capable of generating millions of jobs. Their platform is decolonial and social, focused in, insistently on indigenous populations, communities of color, migrants, de-industrialized or depopulated communities, the poor, low-income earners, women, the elderly, the homeless, people with disabilities, and young people. Here is one of their songs. We are going to rise up, rise up till it's won. When the people rise up, the powers come down. Seeking to boost the economy and haunted by the myth of progress, the great the Green New Deal has certainly not expunged the old dream. Yet it does not seem to me to be a desirable, it, yet it does not seem to me to be desirable today to simply reduce every attempt at escaping the oil trap to its eco-material impossibility. The post-collapse world of small isolated communities that hope to escape death thanks to their local agribusiness does not strike me as particularly appealing. And Collapsology's wonderland of mutual aid is no more or less ideological than the green economy of a new deal. It therefore seems preferable to me to accompany the political sunrises in venturing to overcome the oil economy that still haunts their, their imagination. These awakenings, these uprisings may be multiple. Planetary socialism, solar communism, Aeolian democracy composed of autonomous communities and the undercommon that hollow them out and exceed them, Figures of Heliopolis are many, as numerous as must be the, politi the politicians um, capable of taking care of the geocosmological subjects that we are. Thank you. The politics, yeah, there was a mistake in the last sentence. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick, very much. Um, your essay was quite a wild ride. Um, perhaps I could um, pose a question to um, start off a short um, question period. And um, I really must thank you um, for your um, essay and the, the modifications I think you suggest necessary to understand um, terrestriality or um, involve thinking time and stretches of time and their um, relation to inner and outer space um, in ways that really dramatically open our um, series of lectures. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, in any case, um, you employ a sequence of topologies. First, to show the sun is not in space, but buried in the Earth's past. Second, that the Earth is itself located in cosmological space and time. I, I'm, I'm trying to capture the um, flow of your argument. And along the way, you modify Plato's allegory of the cave and put Benjamin's dialectical image to work, both of which seem fantastic essays in themselves. In any case, this allows you to plot a political path not taken. 
the path of heliopolitics, which is very fascinating. And I hope the question period can um, continue probing you on this. But it also raises first for me, just a theoretical question, which is how close are topology, allegory, and the dialectical image? Is it, it seems that they bleed into one another. Could you speak to these um, differences and similarities first? Yeah, that's very important. In fact, um, when I was listening to you, I was like uh, seeing how you read, in fact, you read my, 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 the progression of the essay. And I think that my obsession is to avoid a double, a double trap or a double problem, you know? Um, the, um, the first one is um, the split, the split between, for example, you know, the Earth and the rest of the cosmos. Nowadays, there is this dominant uh, thought according to which, you know, uh, the Earth is like, you know, it's Gaia, it is a sort of uh, sphere enclosed on itself, and it is as if Gaia was alone and there was no universe. So a cleavage. And there will be a way to get rid of this cleavage, and this way to get rid of this cleavage will be to say that, no, no, in fact, it's not true. There is no separation at all between the Earth and the rest of the cosmos. I try to find a way to avoid two conceptual representation. The one according to which there is an absolute cleavage, an absolute split, the absolute split that some people have seen between humans and non-humans and so on. But I try to avoid a solution that will say, well, oh, is that true? A split, a separation is bad. We need, in fact, to insist on the continuity of everything with everything else. And the danger, like for example, vis-a-vis uh, -vis my own research would be to imagine purely and simply a sort of cosmological continuity. To avoid that, I try to engage a sort of dialectical mode of thinking. That is to say, when you speak about a form of dialectics, it's a way to think simultaneously a distinction and a communication, both. So I try to use different forms, different metaphors, and different system of thoughts, thanks to which it's possible to always reverse our representation. What seems to be outside is in fact inside, and sometimes what seems to be inside turns out to be outside. So I am interested in this process of inversions, not to play with that, but in fact to, um, to propose a form of relation with the earth, with ourselves, and with the cosmos. So there are all these inversions, and uh, so these topological inversions, and we can use Hegel to do that. But for me, the last word is given to Walter Benjamin, because the goal of all these inversions, the sun is not outside, but it is inside, uh, but actually it's not only inside, it is also something coming from the outside. So the final word, I give the final word to Benjamin because what is important in the end is not to produce all these topological inversions. It is to produce an encounter, an encounter between the unseen, between what we were repressing an encounter with the other, because we know that, in fact, we live in societies in which uh, otherness is repressed. The foreigners are rejected. Migrants are, you know, uh, 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 put um, away, are, are, are kept away. Um, so the goal, in the end, is to produce a certain number of encounters between several entities, several temporalities, and several spaces. It's a beginning of an answer, but certainly not clear enough. Thank you. Um, let me sit on that and think for a while. Um, Sabrina and Carolyn, have there been any other questions? Yes, uh, Etienne Turpin has the first question. Super, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi, Great. Etienne. Hey, Frederic, that was amazing. And thanks to everyone at Mosaic uh, for, for, for bringing this uh, group of people together. Um, what an incredible beginning. Um, 
So I, I want to kind of pick up on the, the this amazing point that you, that you just made of both trying to keep um, Gaia in the cosmos, but uh, in a continuity with it so that it might uh, retain some levels of specificity and localization uh, without uh, being caught on the other side of the cut. Um, I think this is so fundamental and such a, a gift from, from your work uh, to be able to balance this, this form of separation. But, so I'm going to though lob a, a bit of a, a more formidable challenge to the front half of the talk, because uh, as a Campanella enthusiast, the, la the back half was just stunning. But on the beginning end uh, with our dear friend Reza Nagarastani, I, I wanted to ask if there might be a bit of a kind of biocentrism that is creeped into the, the narratology uh, on the front end, uh, specifically with respect to the oil as, uh, as, as the dead sun. And I appreciate the Bataille element of this. I'm, of course, uh, fascinated by, by your whole discussion of it. But uh, Nagarastani leans very heavily on the biophysicist uh, Thomas Gold, who, who in fact makes an argument that it's not a dead sun that is producing the oil, it's an, it's an anti-sun. It's a form of biochemical deep biosphere that is a form of life that, that specifically is not photosynthetic. And so I'm actually quite curious, uh, fascinated by, by the possibility that um, would your talk be even more radical and provocative if we were to let go of the biocentrism that informs our current petroarchy? Thank you. Um... <sighs> I don't know. Yes, uh, the dead, the dead sun. Maybe because I wanted to um, give a certain kind of vo voice to the ghost. So maybe I killed it, you know, too quickly. And so maybe uh, there is. But um, the dead sun, anti sun. Yeah, there are different things here. I think that it's, it's like the same. I would say it's the same. I'm not sure. Again, I'm, I'm not sure. I am going to offer an interesting answer. Um, but it's the same thing with you know the humans or anti-humanism. I develop in other books and other essays a kind of anti-humanism. But the goal of my anti-humanism is not to get rid of the humans. I think that uh, uh, my goal is not to replace, for example, the signifier human by, by post-human. What I try to say, I try to jump from one idea to another one, is that we have to be a little bit biocentric. And we have to be able biocentric, and we have to be able to take care of the sun before being able maybe to be to be even even more cosmological. So I'm not sure that I address really what you said, but I think it is important to maintain a kind of uh, the good thing with the dialectical process is that you can keep a certain number of uh, entities and concepts, but you can in fact um, show that they are haunted by something else. So you're not compelled to be against uh, biocentrism because the center of life is itself something that is not living. So maybe I think that I confirm your point, but- um, Because this, this is exactly where I think, <laughs> I, I will send you a few things out to this because I, I'm so excited by this line of thinking and it's so, so amazing to see the, the talk, but definitely the question that the haunting could come from the, the, the very fact that living processes are not restricted to uh, okay. Uh, the biosphere and this okay. kind of um, uh, photosynthetic reality, but this anorganic processes happening deeper in the earth would would haunt in a way that is perhaps even more um, troubling. So I I, so I leave it with this. But such is not live. It means it is not live then, because I, I would say the, the danger for me will be to attribute to grant everything, to say everything is living. Maybe it's not what you wanted to say, but uh, uh, if I say that the center of life is non-living, I don't want to attribute life to this non-living center. But I want right. to know more, right. and I, I want to, to get your text, the text that you are speaking okay. about, and uh, to receive that. Thank you again. For your question, more than a question. 
Um, yes, thank you for that interchange, Etienne and, and Frederick. Um, are there other questions, Sabrina? Um, I'd like to pose a question. Uh, I was interested in this idea of multiplicity that I feel kept coming up in your talk, right? Like uh, a multitude of different traditions and cultures and all of them uh, referencing the sun. So I was wondering if you could speak, oh, and you end your talk with this idea that there need to be a, a multitude of politicians and like a multitude of approaches. So I'm curious what you have to say about this as opposed to being like a, some kind of unified idea. Yeah, I think it's at this specific moment uh, in uh, the writing of this text, the multiplicity has, a, has a, I think, has a specific function. And um, the specific function of this multiplicity is to let us time, it's maybe, you know, relevant for this uh, series, but to um, use, let's say, let's put that this way, to, to use um, the petrol civilization against itself. What I try to say is that we cannot say we are going to pass from one model to another one, and there is only one way to do that. It's impossible to do so because we are trapped in this petrol civilization. So we have to deal with different solutions. But I try to say that my goal is not only to celebrate the multiplicity, but it is the only way to, av to advance, to find, a, to find ways to deal with all the traps that we have to uh, avert. Uh, we, have to, uh, we have to analyze our un unconscious, as I said, we have to understand that in oil is trapped our own desires. So we need to analyze it, to not repeat you know, our... Um, so there are different types of analysis and so different types of different ways to um, um, different, we need to be very inventive, right? It's not only that we have to propose a solution, it is that we have to experience different political possibilities. We have to experience them, we have to experiment them, right? And to see how they offer one, um, one partial um, um, the activation of uh, uh, of petro civilization of the petro uh, civilization civilizational trap. So the multiplicity was thought about that. You know, was thought as a, a way to deal with uh, facts that we cannot go from one. Yeah, again, I repeat myself. We cannot go from one step to another. There is no direct line actually. So maybe this multiplicity is a way to speak about um, uh, curves uh, with, um, you know, different lines and uh, and the impossibility to go straight forward, uh, the, 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 the impossibility to find um, a straight line. There is no straight line. It's impossible. Because the straight line is absolutely the representation at play in, in modern, it is a central representation of modern times, you know. So mm -hmm. linear progress, we go from one point to another. So we have to de deactivate also this representation, not only this representation, but this way of doing things, this way of organizing politics, this way of thinking the future, this way of thinking the past. Thank you so much. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense yeah. to me. Okay, I'm never sure. In English, I'm never sure that what I say makes sense. I'm never sure. Oh, you make perfect sense. Um, we have another question from Joel. Hi. Um, you partially answered this in your last answer about the kind of uh, the multiplicity, but I was wondering what you believe to be the ideal relationship with uh, the sun as the human race whether it's one similar to kind of how the solarites um, respected it, but didn't worship it, or whether it would be uh, seemingly replacing the worship that we currently have of oil and the benefits that it provides with the worship of the sun by changing kind of the ideals that we uh, seek out and the benefits wanted by general society. Yeah, I'm not totally sure I completely understood what you said, but I think the question of the 
replacement, the fact to replace one uh, fetish with another one, you don't say fetish, but, and I was, uh, I don't know if it is cl uh, close or not to what you said, I'm sorry, Joel, but um, while I was working on this uh, talk, on this paper, on this article, I was seeing like a danger. The danger would be to, again, replace one object with an, by another one, with another one. And uh, I think my goal was not to turn the sun into um, a fetish, into you know an object to be only worshipped. So, uh, because um, idolatry does not seem to be uh, the best way to produce uh, uh, you know emancipation, as far as I know. So I was thinking, okay, what might be? I think I use the term Q, um, queer sun, right? And at the moment, I was trying to find. Uh, a way to define the sun as incomplete, certainly not as a pure God. And that's why I was interested in what Julian, the philosopher, says, and to think the sun as a mediation. And I think I rem you remember, I, I think I said, I, I am going to exaggerate a little bit. I'm going to say that uh, the passage from Julian, the philosopher, to uh, the expanding universe of the Big Bang is, a easy, uh, is an easy pass. Of course, it's not true, but the fact to think the sun as a mediation is already a way to decenter the sun and uh, to not uh, to have a relation with the sun as something else as, as, as a pure center. And so if the sun is only a mediation, it cannot be, it cannot be uh, worshipped. Uh, it, it, it has a, a, a crucial place a central place for us in this sense we are we can be uh, centered uh, on our preoccupation it's not a, a problem to be uh, centered in a transient way maybe i would say so we can be like um, um, non-permanently biocentric uh, in a way um, it can be a, a passage a, a moment uh, a focus um, a nod, maybe. And so now I have no idea about what I wanted to say, Joel. I'm very sorry. I don't know if I'm... No, that, that makes sense. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So it's like rather than just purely focusing on it uh, individually, it's like a part of a greater whole. Yes, yes, exactly. A part of... Yeah, yeah we can say that this way. Uh, a part of the whole or a, a mediation just because... Um, uh, the sun can, can be understood as a geocosmological mediation, that something, uh, not like, the, not maybe more important than other things, why not, for us, more, more important than Jupiter, for example, or uh, yeah. Uranus, yeah. But, but a mediation in the sense of enabling a passage. Huh? So um, uh, um, uh, if I say that the sun is a mediation with Julian the philosopher, I say that there is something in the sun able to deactivate, again, I use this term today, to deactivate um, what might lead to an over-centralization. Uh, the sun is not only the sun. The sun is, not, the sun is also um, a vector of something that it is not. There is a... I said that in, a, in, an, in an essay devoted to Afrofuturism because I quote a Russian painter and poet and writer named Pepperstein. I don't remember his first name. And in one of his novels, he imagines that the core of the sun is dark, black, dark, I don't remember now, but it's like a, a sort of opaque. There is like a zone of opacity right in the middle of the sun. And I was interested in this image because it is exactly, you know, what I wanted to say. The sun is incomplete. Huh? The sun is uh, um, in its engaged in a sort of self dialectical process. Huh? The sun is not only the sun. The sun is not only a, a source of life. The sun is also a source of death or a source of something else, of X, of the unknown. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joel and um, Frederick. Um, in terms of mediation, um, I was interested to hear actually that the Emperor Julian's respect for pagan um, worship corresponded to his prohibition against the Christians teaching 
the medieval trivium. And I thought that um, kind of corresponded to um, the aesthetic as a suture, which um, fits into your notion of mediation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, the aesthetics of there is a word that you a term uh, that they did not understand. A chef. Oh, um, as a the aesthetic as a suture in terms of of something um, um, situated between a hermeneutic or a poetic understanding, which seemed to be the three um, types of learning that. Um, Julian would um, forbid the, the, his, the Christians to teach. So it seemed like mediation okay. fit quite nicely okay. into, because he was, it seems like there's a relation between the Neoplatonic um, question of mediation yeah. and perhaps okay. a more sophisticated um, um, notion of the aesthetic that mm -hmm. um, fits between a poetic and hermeneutic um, models of language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. Sabrina, is, is there another um, question? Yeah, uh, Melanie has a question. Hi there. Thanks so much for the talk. It was really uh, fantastic. Thank you. And I, I wanted to ask a question, you know, um, I guess about this discussion at the end, the Heliopolis to come must be based on another grand narrative other than the three that you identify. Uh, and I wonder specifically what you're kind of what you're doing with time here when you talk about a new narrative, right? And uh, coming from, uh, I don't know, feminist, queer, decolonial perspectives, I'm always skeptical of any claim that something is new. Um, so when when we talk about this um, narrative, like maybe an emancipatory narrative or something, I just wonder how you think of, of it in terms of time in relation to, you know, you gave a lot of examples of um, indigenous, uh, you know, conceptions of the sun and uh, energy. And I wonder if there is if there are some through narratives that would be worth identifying rather than thinking of this as entirely new. You are completely right. I think I need to modify that. I need to modify that. Uh, you know, it's a simplification. You like, you know, you say, okay, I'm going to say that, and I'm going to explain the difference between what precedes, like the two uh, bad narratives. So of course, there is this temptation. You know, this uh, temptation to say new, and you have to modify that, not uh, as a local thing, because I think what I wanted to say in my old talk is that we cannot just imagine that there is something new, like, um, you know, the, uh, because I, I wanted exactly to, um, uh, to avoid um, the temptation to say, oh, we have like, uh, you know, like the temptation to speak about an absolutely new narrative. So, and all my talk is, the, is if I decided to speak Egyptians, if I decided to do this kind of, uh, strange kind of collage. I know that uh, I was expecting someone telling, oh, how can you do, how, you, how can you put that together? The Egyptian Bataille, Campanella, and uh, it's too much, uh, different uh, episteme and so on. My goal was precisely to see, uh, to, to, um, to extend, to extend far um, before modern times, uh, the, the, the roots or the, the genealogy of this grand narrative. And so I sh what I should change is, uh, I, I have to, to take a look again and to see that because new, certainly not new because of all what you said, uh, uh, the fact that there is nothing new, you know, as there is something maybe repressed. It is what I said, you know, I said, uh, I think I say that in the, first or second part of my talk, like uh, we missed something. It was already existing, but it was repressed and we could have taken this pass and we took another pass. Or we could say uh, uh, the other pass was, you know, uh, repressed and uh, exterminated, right? Uh, um, subjected to, uh, to, um, to any kind of violence, uh, patriarchal violence or the... So you're right, um, you're right, it's not new. It is, I have to find other words. I have to change the words. I have to find a way to avoid this kind of uh, fascination that I have 
with the new. It's, I'm clearly, you know, I'm not speaking about other people, I'm speaking about me. I want to propose something new. I want to be the one who, you know, and it's not my attempt, but it is certainly uh, the return of the repressed, right? Thank you for that, for that question, Melanie. Um, perhaps we have time and you'll entertain one more question, um, Frederic, if there is one, Sabrina? Uh, there isn't at the moment now. All right. Um, well, maybe we should just um, say many fantastic thank yous to you, Frederic, and to um, Etienne Turpin and Melanie Braith, both of whom will give lectures in the next. Um, okay. Yeah, Melanie. Okay, you don't know that. I have to. Oh, take sorry. That's that's Melanie Unruh. Oh, okay, oh, okay. right. Okay, right. Melanie Unruh. Right. Okay. Um, and also Joel and um, Sabrina, thank you for asking questions. But um, just a reminder that um, uh, Aaron Manning will be speaking next week um, for the lecture, but um, Frederick, many, many thank yous for this tremendous lecture. I thank you and thank you for, your, for these questions because really they enable me to think about how I could modify and rethink uh, this uh, uh, theoretical attempt. And thank you for your invitation again. Um, perhaps we can um, talk briefly at the end, but um, I think this will wrap up our, um, our online lecture today. Everyone, thank you all for coming. <laughs>